Okay, it's time to talk about the dreaded green fungus. What it is and what it's not. Let's start with what it's not. First, it's not a fungus. Second, it's not green until it matures. And third, it's not really something you need to dread and you'll learn why after we dig into the research. Now that we do have a clean slate, the rest of this video will cover everything that hobbyists and scientists know about this disease so that you can be prepared to handle it or so that you can help other hobbyists to see it on their shrimp. I mean, I guess, but what are the chances of even getting a diseased shrimp? What, do I really even need to worry about this? Good question, Rick number two. At least if you're buying Neocaridina like cherry shrimp, a 2023 study surveyed 900 shrimp from different sources and found that approximately 27% of them had this disease. So this is by no means rare. I will say that I have never personally dealt with this disease before. The information in this video is largely from scientific studies and from hobbyists who have shared their experiences online and how they have tried to treat this disease. There are some great resources out there, but I haven't found a single one that is complete or as up to date with all of the latest research. So that's why I'm making this video. You are going to learn something new, no matter what experience level you are in the hobby. With all of that taken care of, let's go ahead and get into what this disease actually is how dangerous it is for our shrimp, and how we would go about treating it and when to treat it, actually. First off, what is the green fungus? The disease got its name because of the feathery green growth that looks kind of fungal. Those green parts are actually filled with chlorophyll, though, which fungi can't create. This infection is instead caused by one of two multicellular algae species called either Cladagonium ogishime or the recently identified Cladagonium kumaki. Both species look very similar to the naked eye and affect our shrimp in the same way. So for the rest of this video, we're just going to call this disease clado. You might also hear this disease called elobiopsidae, but I asked one of the researchers involved in some of the papers we were reading, and they said that was a misidentification from early on. There's still some confusion around the naming, and so if you do see anyone calling it elobiopsidae, please just kindly correct them. Come on, Rick, that's not appropriate in this situation. Let me help out. See? Ah, yeah. Much better. Good point. Clado is most commonly found on Neocaridina, but has also been rarely reported on Caridina, Paratia, and Macrobrachium species. Part of the reason Neocaridina are most susceptible is because they are often grown in large, overpopulated aquaculture ponds under less than ideal conditions. In contrast, the closely related Caridina species don't do well in these unhealthy conditions that encourage the spread of Clado, so they typically would die before the algae can take hold. Clado also doesn't do well at the lower pH Caridina are kept in. Now, let's go into how Clado actually infects shrimp. Clado initially floats through the water as an asexual spore with a flagellum to help it move. Eventually, it finds its way to its host, but the exact way the algae attached to the shrimp is still unclear. It may be ingested and then move around the body until it finds an area close to the surface where it can punch through the shrimp shell. It also, or may instead, enter through previously damaged areas and grow from there. And lastly, it could get stuck in one of the many body crevices on shrimp and burrow into the shell from there. Whichever way it happens, the structure that forms looks very similar to a plant. There are rhizoidal cells acting as roots that dig into the shrimp's body and absorb nutrients from the muscles. There are also basal cells, which sprout a stalk-like filament out from the shell. Little sacs called zoosporangium sprout like fruit from this filament and hold developing spores. Once these spores reach maturity, they get released to find a new host and restart their life cycle. Unlike the rhizoids, basal cells, and filaments, these developing spores break off from the rest of the organism, so they need an energy source. In this case, chlorophyll, which is where they get their green color from. The rest of the growth is relatively transparent, which is why infections aren't caught until they are already well established. By the time you see green, new spores are already everywhere in the tank. That might sound pretty bad to have a bunch of spores just floating everywhere. It depends though. To understand how contagious Clado is, we need to know what conditions allow it to infect shrimp. The papers generally agree that bad water quality with high nutrient levels leads to stress that can make shrimp vulnerable to infection. In addition, any open wounds are excellent places for these spores to come in and infect our shrimp. These conditions are often seen in aquaculture ponds where neocaridine are bred, which is why out of 300 shrimp pulled from those ponds, over 50% of female shrimp were infected with clado. Interestingly, only 30% of the examined males were infected, but 
still a lot. In contrast, only 5% of the 300 male and female shrimp from home aquariums had clado, showing how big of a role water quality and population density play in transmission. Seasonality also had an impact, as we can see that many more shrimp were infected with clado in the spring as opposed to autumn. The researchers hypothesize this difference is due to warmer temperatures, reducing the oxygen concentration in the water and speeding up shrimp metabolism in the spring, leading to a greater buildup of waste as compared to autumn. I do want to mention that all 300 shrimp pulled from aquaculture ponds were only pulled from three operations. There are undoubtedly many more in the world, and so this may not be the most representative sample size. Others may have fewer, but others may also have more. It's tough to say, so it's important to consider the risks when you're buying shrimp. Buying from home breeders or those sellers that are transparent about their growing and quarantine procedures is the best way to avoid clado in other potential diseases. Even with that information, you might feel a little bit nervous about buying shrimp after hearing that like 50% of females could be infected, but don't worry quite so much. Any seller worth their salt is going to visibly check individuals and will catch likely most of the infected ones before they go out, so you will have a much lower chance of getting them than 50%. Regardless, it is still possible, or the infection could develop more visibly after they ship it while the shrimp are, say, in a bag in bad water quality, and so in those cases, you do have to be prepared. Let's go over how contagious this disease actually is, so you can figure out how worried you actually should be if you end up getting a shrimp with clado. The risk of spreading really depends on the conditions of your own tank. In a healthy environment, the chance of clado spreading to other shrimp is pretty low. Many hobbyists may get one to two shrimp that are infected, they quarantine or cull those, and then the rest of the shrimp are just fine, despite being in the same living conditions or in the same bag for an extended period of time. Here's some more detailed anecdotal evidence from a diligent Redditor who took some risks and actually put some infected shrimp into his colony. They reported receiving nine shrimp with various levels of clado infection, but decided to make the best of things and learn more about it. To do this, they kept eight of the infected shrimp apart to live their lives in a quarantine tank, but they stuck one into a colony of a hundred other shrimp to see how contagious it was. In the quarantine tank, Three of the eight cases cleared up entirely, and the remaining five had reduced growth. As for the infected shrimp placed in with the colony, not a single new case of clado appeared in the colony in the three months that the shrimp was in the tank, Whee! or in the eight months after it was removed. This seemed to align with the experience of other hobbyists, as those shrimp that were infected may seem to clear up, and then they could potentially get a reinfection, but the other shrimp seem to be just fine, and there are very few reports of the infection spreading throughout a colony at least again, if it's healthy. If you've had a similar experience with this disease, or if you've had an entirely different experience, we'd love to know in the comments. Even anecdotal evidence from hobbyists is really useful to have so we can understand more about this disease. While we've talked about spores floating around your tank and landing on shrimp or being eaten by them, there's one other mode of transmission that can be very problematic, and that's via molting. Infected shrimp may have some trouble molting, but if they do successfully molt, then a lot of the clado gets stuck to that molt. Any shrimp eating that molt risks ingesting a lot of clado cells that their immune system may or may not be able to fight off. The same is true for shrimp that die with the infection and get eaten by other shrimp. One question I have about that Reddit post is whether the person removed the molt of the infected shrimp or if they just left it in the tank. If they didn't remove the molts, and they still saw no infection, then that may mean that consuming a large amount of clado or a lot of spores still isn't a problem as long as your shrimp immune system is healthy. If your shrimp are healthy, eating clado may be the same as eating any other nutritious algae. Since we don't know for sure though, it's a very good idea to remove any molts or dead bodies that have a bunch of clado on them just in case shrimp do try to eat them. The risk of clado spreading is something that we should be worried about, but there's also something else that we need to think about, and that's how clado increases the chance of other things spreading in our tank. You see, when clado burrows into a shell, it creates opportunities for other bacteria and microorganisms to infect your shrimp. For example, researchers found saprolegnia, a typically harmless water mold, growing in the tissue of shrimp infected by clado. The inflamed tissue shown here in pink is very vulnerable to infection from other sources. That's why clado may be called a primary pathogen, which makes way for secondary pathogens to infect your shrimp, thereby causing a horribly named event called a multifactorial disease outbreak. These are dangerous because they increase the chance of one or more infectious diseases in your tank, making clado potentially the least of your concerns. Now, I know all of this sounds scary, 
but remember that it all depends on your tank health. A healthy tank helps your shrimp fight the Clado infection, preventing or reducing its effects, along with preventing secondary infections that may be even more harmful. How do we know if our tank is really healthy though? Well, we've seen evidence that Clado infections typically get smaller or disappear entirely, as shown by the eight quarantined individuals from the Reddit post. This suggests that even if you get an infected shrimp from a seller, if you have a healthy tank, then the infection should not grow or get worse or spread. If you do see an infection get worse after you put it into your tank, or if you see an infection pop up after a few months that the shrimp have been in your tank, then that's a really good sign that your water quality is not as good as it could be. I won't go into all of the details of exactly like what water quality is, how to improve water quality here, but we do have an article on shrimplyexplained.com that does all of that for you. Understanding what causes bad water quality and how to improve it is absolutely critical for a healthy shrimp tank. When we look at the research, we see clado most commonly appears on the underside of your shrimp in spots where the shell is thinner, like around the leg joints or at the flexible base of the swimmerettes. Hobbyists used to think that it only appeared on the underside, but recent studies have shown that clado can grow around the mouth and rostrum if the rhizoids manage to find a place to dig in. Now, what happens to a shrimp when it actually does get infected? Well, there are a few things. First, there's transparent growth that turns green and feathery as it produces spores. Some people do get it confused and think it looks like eggs, but again, eggs are much more like a berry shape and a magnifying glass will help with getting a closer look to identify it. Now that's the external cloud of growth, but this growth is also happening into your shrimp. So the rhizoids are penetrating the shell and digging their way into muscle, whereby the muscles get infected, turn white and die. In addition to the visible growth and the muscular necrosis, in early stages, the infection just causes minor irritation and partially limits movement by blocking the swimmerettes. As the shrimp continues to move around and as the infection progresses, Clado rubs against parts of the shell and opens up more wounds that can be infected. As the infection progresses, shrimp eventually become sluggish, stop eating, and eventually die. So what do we do with infected shrimp? To be honest, before doing all of this in-depth research, I kind of thought it was a death sentence. The most effective algae treatments use concentrated copper medication, but as you probably know, copper is also toxic to shrimp. An additional problem is that clado burrows into the shell, meaning that simple water baths or other treatments targeting the outside of your shrimp don't penetrate deep enough to get to all the clado, leaving cells that can regrow. This would mean the only way to be certain the disease is gone is to remove the shrimp entirely and cull it. In some cases, culling is still the best way to handle this disease. If you do find a shrimp that is already heavily infected and is lethargic, if it's not eating, then it's very unlikely its immune system is going to recover and function well enough to fight off the infection. The best way to put your shrimp out of its misery in this case is to use clove oil, which anesthetizes your shrimp, followed by freezing after the shrimp can't feel anything. We've got an article online that explains the full process. Assuming your shrimp isn't to that stage yet though, then there's a pretty good reason to be hopeful. As we've discussed, if your tank is healthy, then there's a good chance that it's not going to spread and that infected shrimp will recover. Regardless, it's always a good idea to quarantine any infected shrimp until signs of cloud out disappear. If you wanna learn more about setting up a quarantine tank for shrimp, then check out this article. As for actual treatment of this disease, we couldn't find any reliable scientific papers that provided a reliable cure. Many hobbyists have experimented with varying degrees of success though, and so we're going to talk about the methods they've used. The best way of treating your shrimp comes at it from two different directions. The first angle is external treatment using salt baths, hydrogen peroxide, and or botanicals. Let's dive a little deeper into each one of those. Salt baths are great for focused treatment of a single shrimp. Simply take a cup of aquarium water and dissolve a tablespoon of aquarium salt in it. Once the salt is dissolved, get your shrimp in a net and put that net in the salt water for 30 to 60 seconds. Then move your shrimp back into the quarantine tank. Do this once a day until you see clado die off. Hydrogen peroxide is great for killing off spores and for improving water quality. With the proper technique and dosage, hydrogen peroxide does a great job of purifying your tank without disrupting your tank cycle. Plus, it breaks down into oxygen to temporarily boost dissolved oxygen in your tank, so it's safe and even beneficial if done correctly. While your shrimp is in quarantine, adding a few botanicals like Indian almond leaves, magnolia leaves, or alder cones is a great way to go. These botanicals have tannins in them, which have been shown to boost immune function in shrimp, so they're great to throw in. 
The second angle of attack is internal treatment. Since we want to deal with the leftover rhizoids buried under the shell that external treatments can't reach. The best way that hobbyists have found to target these internal cells is to soak food in Ridic Plus. The malachite green in this product gets ingested and then fights off any remaining clado within your shrimp. The best way to deliver this medication is to soak food in it. In this case, something like glass garden snowflake or other soybean whole based product. Let the food absorb as much as it can, then leave it to dry before feeding it to your infected shrimp. Ideally, do this with enough food so you can feed a small amount each day for a few weeks potentially. Unfortunately, products containing malachite green are not available in certain countries. So if you happen to live in one of those countries, then the best bet is to focus on external treatments and just maintaining a very healthy environment. Now, based on all this information, here's the recommended treatment schedule. Day one, set up your quarantine tank and quarantine your shrimp. After that, salt dip any infected shrimp, then perform hydrogen peroxide treatment on your main tank to kill off any spores. You'll also want to prepare the treated food and then get it drying out. Every day after this, salt dip the infected individuals, then feed a small amount of treated food. Remove any uneaten food within an hour or two to avoid polluting the water. Every three or four days during this treatment, it might be a good idea to replace the salt dip treatment with hydrogen peroxide treatment of the entire quarantine tank. This effectively does the same thing as a salt dip, but it also hits any spores that might be floating around in the quarantine tank. After that, just repeat these steps until clado disappears from the shrimp, which can take up to three to four weeks. Doing this mix of treatments gives you the best chance of success. It isn't 100% successful though, and it may not always kill off all of the clado in your shrimp, and so a reinfection could occur. If you do reintroduce some recovered shrimp into your colony, then just be on the lookout over the next few months to see if it might appear again. That's pretty unlikely in a healthy tank. To be fair, this treatment protocol is a lot of work to save one to two shrimp and only have a chance of success. In some ways, it's safest and easiest to just cull the infected shrimp and avoid weeks of treatment that might work. The goal of this video has been at least to provide you with the most up-to-date information so that you can make the decision that's best for your situation. We also wanted to clarify that you definitely shouldn't feel hopeless if you do get a shrimp that's infected with clado because there are many reports of hobbyists successfully treating it. Again, the best thing that you can do as a shrimp keeper is to keep a healthy tank. That starts with the proper setup. Take a look at this video where we'll explain what goes into setting up a healthy tank so that you can be on the lookout for signs of a healthy tank and make sure that you have the best chance of success as a shrimp keeper. We also have a lot of other scientific based resources to help you on your shrimp keeping journey at shrimplyexplained.com. Thank you so much for watching and happy shrimping.